Okay, we're going to invite our next panel up here. Uh, as you can probably tell, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties with the handheld mics. We'll make sure that the mics for our panelists are working, and we'll start in just a sec. Welcome. I'm Mark Baumster. I'm the government and politics editor with Education Week. And as we've heard, we've been through some huge changes in the last week with the election, from Congress down to the uh, state houses, governor's mansions, all the way down to the local level. Um, education Week's political team has been tracking the K-12 angle on, on education on, in this election from Washington and on the ground in battleground states such as California, Florida, and Georgia. And here to unpack this year's election results and their implications are three of our political reporters. Um, Allison Klein, who is our lead federal policy reporter, Lauren Camera, who is our chief congressional correspondent, and Andrew Ujafusa, who is our state policy reporter. Um, we want to make sure that we have lots of time for, for questions as we get through this and a lot of ground to cover. So I'm going to start right now with the federal piece, and I'd like to talk with Allison. Um, Allison, let's take a look at the election and tell us what some of these results mean for some of the Obama administration's uh, top education priorities, particularly No Child Left Behind, uh, competitive grants such as Race to the Top, early childhood education. So um, as we just heard, this was a big Republican possibly wave election, um, which means a Democratic White House is going to have a lot fewer allies um, out in state houses um, and in Congress. Um, there hasn't been a lot of money for um, competitive grants. I would expect that a um, Republican-controlled Congress would be even less likely um, to continue to fund programs like Race to the Top, maybe even preschool development grants. I would say the $75 billion preschool initiative, if anybody was banking on that, it's not going to happen. Um, so they've just really lost a lot of their, a lot of their power and a lot of their allies. Um, State houses is another um, good place to look. I believe it's either 10 or 11 um, state legislatures flipped to Republican control. Um, so we're likely to see um, possibly a lot more activity along um, the lines of taking aim at or flat out getting rid of um, the Common Core standards in um, GOP state houses. To, to take a look at specifically the waivers, this mm -hmm. is something which has been a, a huge policy priority for the current education. Uh, administration. Uh, what what kind of um, implications do you see from the election results toward um, whether states are more likely to to play ball with the administration on waiver priorities? So I think we're starting to see a shift where states are um, far more in the driver's seat on policies like waivers. I think they're negotiating hand on sort of the wonky um, accountability ins and outs of the specifics of their waivers. The power is going to shift towards the states. Um, just as a kind of a wonky example, we saw um, Arizona and the department had a huge clash over the weight of graduation rates. Recently, Arizona won that, that clash. I think we'll see um, the administration's hand um, just weakened in terms of what they can uh, make states do. Now, the Ed Department still has um, a certain amount of of, of you know carrots and sticks in its quiver. What are we looking forward to in the next two two years from the education department? What are they going to be able to drive in terms of, of policy, regardless of how it's regarded through uh, uh, through the Congress or through the through the uh, the state level administrations? So I mean, they still obviously um, have the veto power, right? They can veto legislation they don't like. Um, they'll be able to outline um, waiver renewal guidance, for, which we're expecting to come out um, this week. Um, and, you know, obviously they still have um, the Office of Civil Rights and its investigative um, powers. Uh, but overall, I would say their hand is a lot weaker um, and they'll spend the next couple of years, you know, really, depending on how you look at it, either supporting implementation in states or kind of sucking up to states so that they'll continue, um, that's another way to put it, so that they'll continue uh, doing the administration's bidding when it comes to things like uh, teacher evaluation and um, college and career ready standards. Those are specific policy priorities that you think they may be driving forward just on their own say so. Right, yeah, they're, they're gonna, it'll be up to states at this point whether they wanna continue the work that they've started in those areas. Lauren, let's go to the Hill for a minute. Um, obviously, there's been a huge amount of turnover. There's gonna be new faces. There's going to be um, new leadership. Um, what, effectively, what allies do, uh, 
President Obama and Secretary Duncan still have on the Hill, and what can they expect in the way of support when they go knocking? Right, that's a great question. So, I mean, election aside, um, the administration is losing two um, extremely big champions in education, that of George Miller in the House and Tom Harkin in the Senate. Um, both have served in Congress for more than, or almost four decades each, so those are two really big champions the administration will be losing. Um, in the Senate, uh, where we have, which will now be controlled by the majority, what we're looking for um, in terms of Democratic allies for the administration will be Patty Murray, who is expected to take the reins for Democrats in the Health Committee. I should point out, um, her home state of Washington recently lost its waivers, so that will be a really interesting relationship to see how she'll play ball with the administration there. Um, sort of gives her some clout going into negotiating strategies. So, um, And then I think you'll see Elizabeth Warren, who has always been a big ally on um, higher ed issues, and Michael Bennett, who's always been a big player in K-12. That's in the Senate side. Over on the House, what we're going to have a little more continuity as far as education leadership goes. And what do you what do you see happening there? Yeah, so um, it's expected that Bobby Scott of Virginia um, steps in to fill Miller's shoes. Um, it will be interesting to see what some of his priorities are. Um, and you know, the administration with the uh, election lost a couple of allies in the form of uh, Bishop, who was a big player in. K-12 issues, um, as well as um, uh, tyranny in Massachusetts. So we'll have to see. Now, with Republicans in control of both chambers, uh, there's a fair amount of education-specific legislation which is still pending, people are looking for action on. Mm -hmm. What do you expect is going to move, and in, in, in what form, maybe in what order? Yeah, well, before the end of the year, we are expecting um, the child care block grant to move, potentially even as early as this week or next week. Um, along the same lines, the education research bill should do pretty well, potentially before the end of the year. Um, looking into the next Congress and next year, um, with Senator Alexander likely taking the gavel on help, um, he has um, already initiated a big priority list that includes No Child Left Behind reauthorization, as well as the Higher Education Act reauthorization. Those are two priorities that John Klein also has laid out in his list of um, get things done next year. Um, there's a lot of overlap. We've written a lot about this. There's a lot of overlap between the two in how they would pursue each of those. Um, regarding No Child Left Behind, uh, no matter what, if, you know, if that bill could move, no matter what we'll see, it will be a decrease in federal role. Um, we will likely see um, school choice measures. It's unclear whether that will come in the form of you know, replicating high-performing charter schools or school vouchers. Um, my guess is that it will be more leaning towards a charter school um, policy there. Um, we're also going to be looking at things like block granting funding to states. Um, and I am also really interested in something I'm keeping my eye on is grade span testing, where we have a decrease um, decrease in the number of tests we give students, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I think um, John Klein has a little bit of a different idea than Lamar Alexander, so that will be something to follow for sure. And then for higher ed, just a, you know, a couple of quick ticks on that. Um, we're already seeing a lot of bipartisanship in the form of you know, competency-based competency testing, um, just a general move to um, make the student loan process easier including um, making the FAFSA form easier, that's how you apply to get your federal aid, and also um, just making the loan process easier, one loan, one repayment process, one grant, things like that. You, you mentioned grade span testing, and this is interesting, I just want to follow up, Allison. Uh, there's been some changes in the, in the administration's rhetoric having to do with standardized testing recently, some very interesting things, both with, uh, with uh, President Obama and with Mr. Duncan. Yeah, um, after years of um, relying on standardized tests as really a cornerstone of a number of their policies, particularly in the area of teacher evaluation, um, President Obama and Secretary Duncan have softened um, their rhetoric in this area, talking about how there are too many tests, test preparation takes up too much time. Um, the National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers sort of have each backed bills that would um, limit the number of tests um, students would have to take. And we recently heard Bill Clinton 
um, talk about how he thinks there should only be three tests given, one in elementary school, one in middle school, and one in high school. So it's definitely an issue um, to, to continue to watch. Um, obviously, the knock on this is that it's really hard to track student growth if you don't test students every year. So it'll be a debate, I think, that we'll hear either through um, ESEA reauthorization, or if that doesn't move, I would expect it in the next presidential election in 2016. Lauren, before we, before we move on to some state issues, and we have a lot of state issues to unpack, um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, um, about campaign spending, specifically union spending. Um, in this last election cycle, some $60 million spent by the National Teachers Unions to influence key races. Um, what was the payoff on that? Yeah, so this was a tough year for, um, this was a tough midterm election for teachers unions. Um, I think that might be putting it nicely. Um, the NEA spent about $40 million the AFT spent about $20 million. Um, a record-setting amount of that actually went to state and local races, um, which is a big shift away from the past when most of that funding has been um, directed towards federal races. They did still play big in federal races. We saw a lot of cash going into um, the Senate races in particular, where they were trying to maintain a Democratic majority there. Um, races like North Carolina, where Kay Hagan eventually fell to Tom Tillis. Um, there was a lot of money spent on campaign ads there. Um, Colorado is another one where a lot of money was spent trying to ensure um, Udall uh, could hang on to that seat. That was unfortunately a fruit, fruitless effort there. Um, but you know, a lot of the spending, as I said before, was directed towards uh, local and state races, um, specifically trying to unseat some of the Republicans who were elected in the 2010 wave. I'm thinking of states like uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania being the only um, real victory, clear victory for um, teachers unions and spending a lot of money um, trying to unseat Corbett. Um, and then, you know, a lot of money was actually spent in down ballot races as well. Um, I mean, the prime example there is the Torlix and Tuck um, race, which I know Andrew can tell us a little more about, um, so I don't want to ruin anything, but yeah. Perfect, perfect transition to state <laughs> issues. There's an awful lot going on at the state level. Um, Andrew, you, uh, you were watching the governor's races, you were watching all of the state superintendents up for re-election. Uh, you were out in California, you were in Florida. Um, just by the numbers, anything you want to add, any, any takeaways? Frank gave us a good setup overview, any specific education takeaways on the numbers? Yeah, well, uh, the short answer is that if you like what happened in 2010, you should break out the champagne and glow sticks for what happened on <laughs> November 4th. Uh, Republicans now control 31 governor seats. That's up three, I think, as Frank mentioned. Um, and uh, Democrats now control 17. There are a couple of outstanding races we don't know the results to. So uh, Republicans clearly tighten their hold, increase their uh, footprint uh, in terms of uh, governorships. Um, they also now control, I believe, 30 state legislatures. Um, and interestingly, the number of states where there's split control, where you have a governor who is a one party and a legislature controlled by the other party, uh, that number increased, I believe, from 11 to 18. Uh, so particularly in states like Illinois, uh, Massachusetts, and Maryland, where you will now have Republican governors working with legislatures controlled by Democrats. I think those states in particular will be interesting to watch. Now, local conditions are, uh, very often dictate uh, the results of these elections, but what, what did you see in terms of overriding education issues, things that were common really across the landscape at the state level? Yeah, um, I would say one of the biggest issues, and I think the issue that one could call sort of the big winner, if you will, out of this election is uh, school choice. Um, I think uh, Republican candidates in particular who supported uh, school choice measures did very well uh, Republican governors who were targeted uh, in some respects because of their policies on education, whether it be unions or school choice, uh, you saw almost all of them survive. Uh, Sam Brownback, uh, for example, in Kansas got a lot of flack for his education spending record, uh, as did Rick Scott in Florida. Um, and you saw Scott Walker and Rick Snyder targeted for their actions regarding collective bargaining. Uh, they all did well. There's, there's a good stat that there were, uh, there were 10 states in 2010 where Republicans took governor's uh, mansions away from Democrats, and nine of those guys won on November 4th. The only guy uh, to lose who fits that category, as Lauren mentioned, is 
Tom Corbett uh, in Pennsylvania, but I think um, school choice did particularly well, and there are several states uh, where you could see that expand uh, next year based on what happened on November 4th. So with this, with this newly empowered cadre of Republican governors, um, where do you see that uh, they'll be really be able to put the, uh, you know, put the pedal to the metal on their priorities, and what are some of the places where they could face some challenges? Uh, well, as I said, I, I think you could see uh, Scott Walker, for example, push to expand vouchers in Wisconsin in 2015. Uh, they did a limited expansion, I believe, in 2013, the last time they had a full legislative session. Uh, you could see him uh, push for an expansion of that in 2015. Uh, I think you saw before the election that Nathan Deal uh, in Georgia is talking about creating something similar to what Tennessee and Louisiana have in terms of a, a state-run district where obviously charters would get a big emphasis. I think you could see Rick Scott uh, tackle issues uh, surrounding charter schools and, and virtual schools. So there are a lot of states like that. And there are also states where, for example, uh, in Illinois, Bruce Rauner is going to have to work uh, with a legislature controlled by Democrats. He wants, he wants to push pension reform as well as expand uh, the role of charter schools. Uh, you know, he has a charter school background in Chicago. Uh, so how is he going to make those two big policy priorities work in Illinois, it's going to be interesting to watch. Charlie Baker in Massachusetts wants to lift the cap on charter schools, but the democratically controlled legislature just rejected that idea earlier this year. So how is he going to uh, push that priority through? So uh, those are just a few states that are going to be interesting to watch. Now, what about Common Core? We heard how politically charged Common Core is in general. Does that translate into action by these Republican governors? Well, so it's sort of a one hand on the other hand situation. So I think on the one hand, you can say you did not see 10 or 15 people win governor seats sort of uh, championing and shouting for repeal of the Common Core. I don't think that was a major issue uh, in gubernatorial races in particular. Um, and you know, Scott Walker has called for its repeal in 2015 in Wisconsin. Uh, some of his GOP allies in the legislature say, well, I don't know if that's such a good idea, Scott. So we'll have to see how that goes. Um, so on, on the other hand, if you look at state chiefs races, there were st seven state uh, chiefs elections this year. Uh, six of them were won by Republicans. The one in California is technically nonpartisan. All six of those Republican candidates in some way uh, expressed skepticism about or opposition to uh, the Common Core. Uh, the most prominent one, the most stridently against the Common Core, was the uh, chief in Arizona, uh, Diane Douglas. Uh, she made it the centerpiece of her campaign. Now, does that mean that Republican governors and other legislators are going to look at that and say, ooh, maybe we better start backing away from that? Because, because where it was a bigger issue in state chiefs races, um, a lot of the anti-Common Core folks won. And the other thing I would say is that uh, so far what we've seen in, in a few states is that um, you know, a lot of the anti-Common Core push can come from folks who we've never heard of, from legislators. They're doing things right now maybe, and we're sitting in this room, we don't know who they are, but all of a sudden we'll see legislation pop up in the state to repeal the standards. Uh, so the question may not be how many governors are calling for its repeal. It may be what is a governor going to do when a bill actually gets to his desk? or her desk. Are they actually going to sign it? Or are they going to say, no, no, we're going to keep the Common Core. We're not going to do this. Now, I want to ask, before we go to, I have one question I want to ask before we get to, to q and I do want to talk about California. Yep. Um, you spent a fair amount of time in California, biggest superintendent's race in the country, uh, big differences in educational philosophy on display. What's your takeaway from that election? Um, so on the one hand, Tuck made it a close race. Marshall Tuck, the challenger, uh, who was going up against the incumbent Tom Torlickson. Uh, who was backed by the unions. Uh, Marshall Tuck, uh, actually, if you look at the results, Tuck did very well uh, in counties where there are relatively large shares of Republican voters in California. Now, take it with a grain of salt. This is California we're talking about. But he actually won a lot of counties where uh, GOPs, ha uh, the Republicans have a large share of voters, like in San Bernardino, San Diego, Riverside. Uh, now, they were both Democrats, uh, so, but it's, those are interesting numbers for folks to consider when they're thinking about Marshall Tuck. I, I think, so he, he made it a close race statistically, and there's a lot of money involved. On the other hand, you know, he had an issue come right down the middle of the plate uh, when uh, the Vergara ruling came down earlier this year. Uh, that was tailor-made for his campaign, and it became 
just as abortion is in, in many congressional and other races, Vergara became a wedge issue uh, that Tuck was uh, eager to utilize and was able to utilize uh, because of the ruling. And that kind of ruling doesn't come along all the time uh, for state superintendents. Uh, and he still lost. So the question is, are they going to be able to replicate uh, the people back in Tuck? Uh, I hesitate now to call them reformers after what Brandon said. <laughs> um, but uh, the question is, are they going to be able to replicate that in four years uh, and, and uh, overcome the, the union power? That was clearly on display in November 4th. Thanks. We're going to have to see what happens with that. Um, we, we do want to ask, open this up to, we have a, a few minutes for questions. And I'm sure, um, given that, that our folks have been digging very deep into this, we've got some questions um, having to do with the state aspect and the federal aspect of the, of the elections. Hi, right back here. Sheila Allen, National Association for Alternative CERT. I also teach at Harvard Community College. So I wanted to ask a question about the higher ed. Did I hear you correctly that there, there's more of a focus on competency tests at the higher ed institutions? So if, if we're pulling away from testing at the lower ones, they're actually increasing it at the higher ed ones. Is that true and why? So you're asking about competency-based degree programs and things like that? Well, there's just been a focus on um, assessment at, at higher ed institutions. Um, so I'm, I'm asking, are you talking about competency tests for all higher ed students as they leave the college? So, so what I was referring to is that there's some bipartisan agreement about trying to experiment with competen competency-based degrees where students move through colleges um, not based on a credit hour necessarily, but based on what they know and what they are able to show that they know. Um, this, for example, is one way to drive down costs. Um, you know, get through college quicker, your tuition payments won't be as big, and therefore your loan payments won't be um, as burdensome when you graduate. Um, there is a lot of bipartisan agreement around that. We saw a, a very small bill of, about competency-based um, programs just moved through the House this year with um, big bipartisan backing. So I would imagine that some provision re regarding competency-based issues um, gets included in a larger reauthorization if that should move over the next few years. Hi, I'm Patty Curtis with the National Center for Technological Literacy at the Museum of Science in Boston. And my questions are, who are the major anti-Common Core backers? And how does that bode for next generation science standards adoption and implementation? Um, well, I, I think it's fair to say that broadly speaking, there, there are folks on both sides of the spectrum who are uh, opposed to the Common Core for, for various reasons. But I think when you're talking about uh, actual muscle in state houses and, and folks who push back against it, introduce bills targeting the standards specifically, not so much the tests, uh, you're talking about uh, people who are conservatives, uh, Republicans, in some cases they, people might call them Tea Partiers, what have you. Um, so uh, I think historically in 20, going back as far as uh, 2011 and 2012 and continuing into this year and probably next year, you'll likely see conservatives continue to push anti-Common Core bills where they do uh, come up. Um, I am not the expert on the next generation science standards, but I believe it has become a factor in at least a few states uh, where you have folks who say, uh, you know, well, remember the Common Core and how much we didn't like that? Well, look at these science standards. Um, so I don't have a count on that, but um, I, I do believe that there has been, at least uh, politically speaking, uh, some sort of spillover effect between Common Core pushback and pushback to those science standards. Yes, we have a question back here. <coughs> uh, from the uh, live stream. Will Senator Alexander hold public hearings about Common Core as we did in school to work days? Well, that is a great question for one of our next panelists. So you should all stay tuned. Um, I am not sure. I have not had a chance to ask Senator Alexander that myself. Um, my understanding is that a lot of, um, he does have an anti-Common Core bill. Um, and I imagine 
potentially some sort of language involving Common Core would be added to a No Child Left Behind reauthorization, something like the federal government is not allowed to make states adopt Common Core. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great question for our next panelist though. <laughs> I think we have a question over here. Um, my, my question is, you know, you call it kind of a so-called so -called wave, Allison, I think, and I kind of agree with that perception um, of, the, of the outcome because my question is, does the teachers union have problems beyond just fighting with Republicans on education? If you look at the outcomes, they also either didn't win or ended up having to reluctantly support candidates that probably aren't aligned with their issues, whether you look at Colorado's gubernatorial race, Rhode Island, New York, you know, Cory Booker, I mean, he was already kind of a shoe in um, But a number of Democrats that probably don't fall in line with their issues were their only so-called victories. And I set aside Corbett's race because any, most of us probably knew he was going to win or lose. Corbett was going to lose a month, two months ago. But do you think that they're having problems within their base uh, where they're starting to lose or have to reluctantly support Democrats that aren't fully in line with their issues? Do you want to take that? You learned so much about them. Um, sure. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a really great question. It's also a really difficult question. Um, I think, you know, that is true. You are seeing this sort of shift away from what you would imagine as traditional teachers unions. Um, you know, Democrats are typically considered the traditional champion of teachers unions. Um, that has changed in the last four years for sure, especially with some of the administration's policies like no child left behind, uh, excuse me, like uh, race to the top and waivers, which are sort of, you know, pushing teachers unions to accept some policies that they maybe wouldn't have thought about accepting, um, you know, four to eight years ago. Um, so I, I think this is an evolving, um, evolving political shift for them and they might be trying to feel out where they can um, stay really, really relevant. And I think, um, you know, with teacher prep programs, we'll see them sort of start to, you know, shine in that area would be my assessment. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think um, President Obama has been um, really closely identified with, and I hesitate to use the word again, but the reform, um, or what uh, builds itself, I guess, is the reform wing of the Democratic Party. Um, and it will be interesting now that he's been so significantly, I think, weakened by this last election um, to see how those sorts of candidates do going forward and also to see where the Democratic Party is um, in 2016. Um, certainly Hillary Clinton, who is um, kind of the presumed nominee, um, has, is, is closer uh, to the teachers unions, I think, than President Obama was when he ran in 2008. We may have uh, time for just, just one more question if we have any from the field. Let me just ask the panel here really quickly, um, uh, what can we say from this year's election that may tee up education issues for the 2016 presidential race? So my big question is um, whether Common Core, and it sounds like uh, from listening to Frank's presentation, uh, the politicalization of Common Core isn't going away. So I'm interested to see um, what that will do to the uh, kind of Republican field, um, particularly uh, Governor Jeb Bush, who we all know has been um, a big supporter of the standards, just this, you know, pretty much quash his ambitions. Um, and then I'm, I'm curious to see how things like teacher evaluation through test scores, how that plays on the Democratic side. Yeah, well, you definitely stole my answer with Common Core. I think um, looking ahead to the 2016 failed Common Core, while it surprisingly didn't really play um, a big role at all in the federal races, I'm expecting it to play a pretty large role in the 2016 presidential election. Um, and especially if we are able to, if we, I say Congress, is able to reauthorize No Child Left Behind, it will be really interesting to see, um, you know, how some of the, the early repercussions of whatever reauthorization they're able to move through um, play out? Well, there are so few, unfortunately, <laughs> state level elections on down in 2016, but you know, on Common Core, and, and I think people are gonna be looking at Jeb Bush for that. The only thing I would add to that is that th there are other areas where Republican base voters, I think, view Jeb Bush as not as tough as he should be, such as illegal immigration. And so I think that might get, in terms of concerns among Republican primary voters, uh, 
with Jeb Bush, I think illegal immigration, for example, might get uh, more attention. And then people will probably throw in, oh, and he's for Common Core. So you know, <laughs> we can't have that. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how much people throw that into the mix. I think that's the question. Well, I want to thank all members of our panel. And um, we'll be able to. Thanks, Mark and colleagues. Um, I think this has been a great way to kick this off. Um, again, I want to thank Frank Newport from Gallup for his uh, analysis earlier on. Um, I think this has been a great one to take on the general political landscape in election 2014. Um, I think we got a sense of the kind of complexity of the electorate, the role of historical trends, the kind of structural dynamics of, of the election. So maybe it's not a Republican wave, maybe it's more like a Republican ripple. Um, but certainly, um, we're going to be seeing some changes, and we've had a great sense of what we can, what we have seen, and what we can expect coming specifically for education. It's very intriguing to think about how these two pieces fit together. Um, you know, we, we've heard more than once already today that uh, education has become increasingly politicized over the past couple of years. But it's interesting because it's not necessarily straight down the traditional partisan lines. We have kind of fraying on the Democratic side, whether it's looking at. Uh, issues having to do with kind of certain aspects of the stimulus programs and uh, requirements around teacher evaluation and compensation in particular, uh, merit pay and policies like that where we're seeing some space between traditional allies. On the Republican side, it's interesting to look at something like Common Core where there are, whether you think of folks as kind of Tea Partiers or others kind of more traditionally on the right, taking an anti-Common Core, let's let the states, you know, continue to, you know, be in charge of their own business type of approach, whereas the business and community, um, many players have been consistently strong and vocal supporters of Common Core um, in the interest of kind of strengthening the economy. Um, so a lot of fascinating um, observation uh, to come. Um, politics and education specifically. We're going to take a break now. Um, we're going to reconvene here at 245 sharp. So if you're kind of here in the Great Hall, go out and enjoy your snacks. If you're there um, online, go get yourself a cup of coffee, go get yourself a bowl of popcorn, and we'll be back for our Inside Education Roundtable. Thank you.